Let's go behind the mask. Welcome back to another edition of the Behind the Mask podcast. I am your host, Takeo Spikes, joined alongside by my co-host, better known as the... Your favorite plus-size model, Tucson Ray, is in the building. What up, too? What's good, brother? Listen, man, we... we we listen. We we pride ourselves on bringing a lot of diversity. We everything. You can start in one area and go to the next. We're saying that we got a special guest in the house. Listen, man, he's done a lot. We know him personally from the gridiron field, but a yeah. lot of our viewership will probably know him just simply based off what he's done since he's retired. But without further ado, we want to bring you into the broadcast. Our home team, homeboy, New York football giant, Rashad Jennings. What's up, bro? Hey. Yeah, what's up? What's up? Appreciate y'all having me on, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. So, you know, every we all had to pivot. Of course, we would love to have you in the studio in Atlanta, the Behind the Mask Studios, but we can't. So, therefore, we had to rely on the social distancing measures. And uh, we're saying that. How has everything been for you since everybody has to pivot, regardless of whatever field that you're in? But where are you and how have you had to pivot dealing with the social distancing and everything that's going on? You know, I've, I've actually, uh, it's unfortunate that it's taken this um, pandemic for me to unplug, but I've been enjoying the, the aftermath of, you know, my mental, of, uh, Spending time with family, reevaluating what's truly important to me, um, you know, doing in, in and odd things, cleaning out the garage with my mom, uh, working on gardens, working on other projects, writing. Like it's that time space where I one oddly enough, I've, I've, I've said this to a bunch of people. I don't know how I have I, everything's been canceled on my agenda, but I still find myself more busier than I ever have been. Like, how is it that nothing's on my schedule, but I'm super busy? And, uh, you know, I've appreciated it. I really have in an odd way, um, just mainly because I get the time with family. And I don't have an excuse. I've started up my uh, life and marriage counseling courses because uh, I want to be a marriage counselor in the latter years of my life. So I'm getting my master's. Again, I've started a couple other writing projects, working on some film, um, play scripting, and a lot of things. So I'm taking advantage of it. Bro, and what you just brought up, you talked about even going into marriage counseling, similar to when we talk about what we're going through through the pandemic, that equates to adversity. And you faced a lot of adversity throughout your life, uh, especially early in the beginning when you got the scholarship to go to Pitt. The only fourth true freshman running back to ever start there at that time. Then you transferred to Liberty. Adversity comes to mind again because you wanted to be at home by your family. Your father, uh, he was sick at the time. So um, talk about how your journey, talk about your journey and how you were able to overcome all of that. Yeah. So for that, it's a very long story, right? And I try to condense it as much as I can. And, um, you know, I appreciate always getting an opportunity to talk about this um, because I was an overweight, chubby kid, right? Glasses, asthma, I had a .6 GPA at one point in time. Uh, fifth string running back in high school football saying that I want to play in the NFL. And so clearly I had to overcome a lot of obstacles and adversities to find myself uh, in a position that I did. And, you know, I, I don't take full credit for it. Um, if it wasn't for loving people that believed in me before I knew who I was, uh, you know, men and women around me that made sacrifices um, before I knew what a sacrifice was or looked like. Uh, I wouldn't be here, but man, I my junior, quick quick synopsis is it was one point in my life where I took a 180. I started to take ownership, responsibility, and stop blaming everybody else. And um, that's when I transferred my junior year in high school. I transferred from a public school, the fifth stream running back, the point six. Transferred to a public school. I repeated my junior year. I took nine homeschool classes plus nine summer school classes on top of the regular academics. Um, and I bust my tail, lost 30 pounds. I got a shot 
a chance to play running back. And I never looked back, man. From there, it was a kind of history. And I've always taken that attitude of really taking responsibility and having an awesome responsibility um, as well to carry carry the name that I have uh, on, on my on the back of my jersey. Um, as a Jennings, you know, my oldest brother was the first in, in our, our family to go to college. He kind of set the tempo, and I wanted to mimic that. So, you know, that, that led me to eventually get an opportunity to do Dancing with the Stars, which that's a whole nother world I fell in love with, the art of dance. And it's really neat because I got a chance to go from this American gladiator sport, right, man amongst men, and beast, um, brute right just raw strength and then all of a sudden i transitioned from the man amongst men to dance like polar opposite worlds and i was able to be successful in both realms and it's kind of neat um to to see you know how much football really can teach you where it can take you um as well as dance how much it can teach you and take you and the the, the stereotypes uh, of which both are I got a chance to experience those and really understand that, uh, you know, as a human, first and foremost, we, we, we all look and try to find ways to fit in, find our space and who we are and to express ourselves. And uh, I'm a one that loves arts, to so play the guitar, <clears throat> love dance, football, archery, poetry, card tricks. Like I love expression, you know, the different colors of myself. And so, you know, that led me to eventually writing a book titled The If and Life, which became a New York Times bestselling author uh, on the list. And so I'm humbled that I was able to play in the NFL uh, for eight years from an unlikely kid. I'm humbled to get a chance to experience dance um, and winning a mirror ball trophy. And I'm super humbled to become a New York Times bestselling author um, in, a, in a space where I had a 0.6 GPA. And so, you know, I can't take credit again for everything. I just, I'm fortunate. And I want to give it back to as many kids to find an avenue to 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 grow and be successful as well. So that's where I spend a lot of time at Rashad Jennings Foundation, uh, focused on reading, education, literacy, and mentorship. You've done a lot, man. And and you talk about the 1% that actually makes it to the NFL. That's incredible. But the success transcended off the field as well. So what are some of the lessons you learned from the league that you still apply to your life every day now? Man, so I would say with the league, when opportunity presents itself, it's too late to prepare for it. Um, I say that because, man, I was a second string running back for a while. <laughs> um, and, you know, the first time I even got a chance to touch the field, I was so I got drafted in 2009. I was backing up Maurice Jones Drew. He a monster, right? And the dude don't ever come off the field. And um, it was one, the first time I got on the field, his shoe fell off. He's in the huddle, he couldn't get his shoe back on. And uh, so he's, he's holding his, he's holding his cleat and he's waving, waving somebody to come in. The coach, right, I can't just jump in, I'm a rookie. So the coach looks around, Janice, get in the game. I was like, all right, I'll go in the game. I'm nervous, right? Uh, this is my first time actually playing. Um, and they call a, they call a run play. Long story short, I scored a 30 yard touchdown on the first play I touched the ball. Oh, and so, so you can't tell me. Yeah, you can't tell me nothing. You can, you know how that felt, right? So I throw the ball, I'm crunk, I'm beating my chest, I'm chest bumping everybody. <laughs> and uh, but funny story is that Maurice, from then on, he started spatting. His shoe never came off. <laughs> <laughs> I, <don't like> <laughs> <laughs> I still mess with him on that one. But uh, from that, man, it's just when opportunity presents itself. It's too late to go get ready. Like, you have to be prepared, man. And I, I feel like that's true and exists to all of us in our, in our lives. Whatever it is you want to do and accomplish, I think it will show its face at least three times. It's just a matter of not was you ready to capture it. And I was in that moment. I knew my playbook. I was in shape. You know what I mean? I was, pres I was ready. And so that's one of the things the NFL has definitely taught me is when opportunity presents itself, it's too late to be prepared. So always, always, you know, plan my plan B, right? My plan, my plan B was to accomplish plan A. Now I did have a plan C, but I say that to the severity of how important it is to focus and uh, be ready.
Yeah, you, you talked about the opportunity, making sure that you're ready. And the league, it was able to teach you that. But I want to know, um, you've written three books, and what opportunity presented itself for you to say, you know what, I really can be an author. And by the way, you're also a New York Times bestseller with your book, The If in Life. So like, how did that all came about for you to pursue a career in writing? Appreciate that question too. So as a, I've always enjoyed writing. It's not a newfound passion, it's a newfound appreciation uh, from others. And when I was, I actually, so I had, I felt every English class I've ever taken in high school. I passed every single Spanish class with an A I've ever taken in high school. I can't speak a lick of Spanish, but I'm, but I became a New York Times bestselling author, English. So I don't understand really how this works, this grading scale. So it's not that it's not that I just found a love for writing. I've always wrote. It's just I used to get F's. Um, prime example. <laughs> I wrote. Uh, we had to write an essay paper about our hero. We had to put it in that time. I think it was CLA format. Cite all your sources, et cetera, et cetera. So I went to the library. I wrote about Dr. Martin Luther King. This was a uh, ninth grade year, and I'm I'm looking at some sources because I'm trying to find something that I can quote. Right? You gotta you gotta put other people's quotes in there. Um, so I couldn't find anybody to say what I wanted to say. So I got the bright idea as a ninth grader to quote myself. So at the end of it, the resource I put was Rashad Jennings' mind. That was my source. And I turn it in. I get, I get it back. I get a big fat F, right? So I go up to the uh, teacher and I asked her, I said, Ms. Selman, why did I get an F? She looked at me and she said, well, Rashad, you, you quoted yourself. And I said, yeah, that's true. But is what I said true? She said, yes. I said, is what I mentioned relevant to the paper? She said, yes. I said, so why'd I get F? She said, because you're not a credible source. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> okay. So you're telling me I have to go do something oddly amazing in this world 20 years from now, just to be able to come back and say the same things? Because if it's true now, it's going to be true then. And she laughed at me and said, should I get out of here? So I left. Fast forward, I'm in the league. I do a lot of public speaking and a lot of stuff at the schools. And I knew a, a teacher that asked me to come speak to their class because they're doing an essay on professional athletes. So I went to the class, I'm talking to the classroom and they're taking notes. They put in their paper, a quote, Rashad Jennings. They turn it in, they get an A. So I took every single paper that was quote Rashad Jennings as a credible source on their paper and they got an A and took it right back to that high school teacher. Slapped it on the table and said, hey, look, check this out. Yes, sir. So it's, it, that's why I was failing in high school. I thought I was smarter than high school. I really did. Um, in some ways I was, but not, not to the system. You know, I really had to understand it was just a system that I had to oblige by. I had to do what was necessary to get through. I went to Pittsburgh Univers University and I won Freshman Writer of the Year Award, free writing about the word nothing. So this has always been a passion um, to write, to inspire. And it's just so fortunate that the league kind of catapulted the name to be respected um, by the publishers in order to, for the opportunity to put out um, some material. That's amazing, man. And you, you just keep setting the bar. I mean, we, we both, we've all played in the league, I should say. Takeo has a book behind the mask as well. So he's an author. I have a guitar, but I had like six years. I've never played. Um, I think where you where you like surpass us is Dancing with the Stars. What went into that? And is there anything that Rashad Jenkins can't do? Yeah, hey, Dancing with the Stars, man. Listen, have y'all ever ballroom dance? Never. <laughs> never. Y'all got to do it, man. You got to. You got to try it one time, man. I'm trying to tell, I tell everybody. You salsa? Yeah, I, tr I tried to salsa. This ain't working, man. Yeah, it ain't working for me, man. I just <laughs> watch, I watch. Bro, it was uh. It's spices worse. <laughs> I, I, 
it was two, chill out, bro. <laughs> just brag on Spike sign right now. No, but I tried, I tried to sauce it though, and like, and I'll be honest with you, you don't even know this. Like, the same way you touched a lot of the other people who quoted you and you took it back to your high school teacher or to your teacher at that time. Um, like I saw you dancing, so I was like, all right, I'm gonna try this sauce. I was dating this chick. And uh, she was actually um, Cape Verdean, and she likes to, to sauce it. So I was like, let's try it. Man, listen, I should have called you before I went. <laughs> I did not know it was that hard, though. Hey, that's funny, man. Yeah, that man hey, tried listen. to sauce so he wound up doing the marinara. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's classic, man. But nah, it, it's, it's a beautiful art. Um, it's a language, man, that's universal. Where you know you can go to, and, and each each dance has its own style, right? You know, you get into proper ballroom and uh, salsa. It's you know more so social dancing. But if you get into the fox trots, and then you can slide over to contemporary, and then jazz, and you know, I found another art called zouk, right? That I fell in love with, which is a Brazilian um, dance that that is comes from Labada, and it's uh, so many different styles of dance and. I truly fell in love with it, probably because I'm I, one. I'm a romantic. Two, uh, I love relationships, um, hencing why I want to be a marriage counselor. And the reason why I even want to be a marriage counselor is because I spend a lot of times doing philanthropic work. I notice when I go to mo most broken communities, typically have the most broken marriages. Most healthy communities typically have the most healthy marriages. And for myself, beyond, you know, the, the, the work that I do through the Rashad Jennings Foundation, I also, because I have a passion to listen and to hear people out and connectivity and intimacy and developing that uh, between people, just not even, it doesn't even have to be um, with spouse. It can just be human to human. Um, I appreciate that time and space. So if I can dive into broken communities and heal it from the top of family. Cause if you raising your family, right, you're really helping the next generation. And so I'm, and a lot of people don't have time for adults. You know, it's like, Hey, I'm going to help these kids out. The adults, y'all got to figure it out. But these adults, right. That, 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 that need to figure it out type of attitude are the ones that's influencing <laughs> the, the next generation. So, I think it's a lot more to marriage, and um, I think God designed it that way, particularly for many reasons I could dive into. But you know, that's where my heart is. And 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 dance, boy, I tell you, like you said, it, you said, you said it, you said you was talking to this girl, and, and y'all wanted to go dance. There's a there's a lot of communication that happens in the dance um, that I I would love to you know demonstrate or help you out with one day. I think it'll really open your eyes to some stuff. Listen, man, I'm down, bro. So I'll definitely be calling on you soon. And and like the more and more I hear you talk, like, you know how we all think about doing certain things. And we always lead with this one word. It's the like, man, if I would have thought about it earlier or if I would have did this, then I probably would have had taken the advantage of taking my time and doing it. So I want to ask you about your book, The If and Life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talked about specifically the point where you took ownership and responsibility for the things going on around you. The accountability piece. Talk about that pivotal moment to where the if was so relevant to you and you just had to take advantage of it. Yeah, I will, will say one of the like breaking points and turning point points to, you know, my trajectory of my life was is the relationship with my pops um <clears throat> so when i was 13 for one my, my dad used to drink religiously drink and smoke until he couldn't anymore when i was growing up i didn't really have a relationship with my pops he was in the house but he wasn't there um and growing up that was tough you know, again, going being an overweight kid, I got two older brothers, right, 10 and 14 years older than me. So they grew up with a different father. My dad did go to the Air Force. Um, 
he had PTSD from it. He struggled and he, he, he coped with alcohol and smoking. And so that's the father I grew up with. And, um, you know, so my brothers are again, 10 and 14, 13 years older than me. So they're out and about living their own life. And, uh, they both played in the NFL as well. And he come kind of like the black sheep, like what, what happened to him? So, but my father and I didn't have the best relationship. He's never taken me to a movie, uh, to go putt, putt, having a conversation about the birds and the bees. Like he just literally sat in his room drinking smoke. And, um, you know, I just kind of kicked it with my mom. <clears throat> and it came to one point where I was hospitalized because I had an asthma attack due to my, partly my dad smoking in the house all the time. And I'm sitting in the hospital and um, I'm hooked up to wires. I don't know if anybody's ever been strangled or had been held underwater for a long time, but an asthma attack is unreal. Um, I'm blowing through a peak flow. It determines your breath, uh, the pressure of it, and it's blowing only a centimeter. So I'm fighting for my life, much less what, what I accomplish or do in the world. I'm just trying to see tomorrow. And the doctors told my dad, you got to stop smoking around your son. Explain to him the um, scientific reasons why, right? All the medical. We come back out, long story short, we get, we get back out, we come home. You know, we had to change the vents. My mom would call restaurants before I went. Like, it, it was bad. And uh, my dad started smoking outside. Two weeks later, he started smoking back inside again. And I was downstairs in my room. Here's the turning point. My, I was downstairs in my room, and, he, and I started sm smelling smoke seen through the vents. And I started choking up. And so I put a pillow over my face, and I go upstairs. And I knock on my dad's door. He doesn't open. I open it. He's sitting in the corner, drinking and smoking like he always does. And I looked at him. This is the little overweight, chubby kid. Glasses, asthma, the point six. Um, I removed my pillow. I said, hey, dad, can you stop drinking and smoking to be there for me? He took a puff of his smoke, took a sip of his drink. He looked at me. He said, Rashad, what you want to do when you get older? Now, granted, he's never asked me this before. So part of me is excited, you know, that I actually get to tell him. Uh, but the other part, I can see that he's just totally being arrogant. But I take my chance anyway, and I tell him. I say, Dad, I want to play running back in the NFL. He looked at me, took another puff of his smoke, he, he took another sip of his drink, and he said, Rashad, you think you'll be able to make it to the NFL without drinking or smoking your damn self? Kind of like, who are you to question me in my own home? And uh, with tears in my eyes, I looked at him. I said, Dad, just to prove you wrong, I'm never going to do it. And I'm going to make it to the league. Now, <laughs> being 30 at the time, I, I retired at 32. I, I made it to the league. I never drank alcohol a day in my life. I never smoked a day in my life. And it literally was just to prove him wrong. And in doing that, him watching his little knucklehead kid prove him wrong. At that time, it caused him to quit drinking and smoking himself. And that helped our relationship. Me and my pops had had the best relationship from my ages of 25 until 30, 30, 35. Uh, my father passed away in March, uh, which is why I'm still in Virginia. I came here to Virginia to, to be with family and set up the funeral uh, for my father. And I've been here since COVID, but before that, before his passing, you know, he, he probably wouldn't have made it another three more years had he not quit drinking and smoking. So we feel like we saved each other's life at that particular moment. I caused him to quit drinking and smoking. He put uh, anger inside of me that I was able to channel the right way, right? Anger is powerful. Anger is a powerful substance. Now, what you do with it is up to you. And if... I didn't use that anger the right way. I wouldn't have the life that I have right now. And so that was probably the biggest if moment um, that I've had to start the trajectory of me becoming uh, my own man. That's amazing, man. And, and you talk about that if in life, you talk about that 180, that pivotal point. We see it all around us. And uh, even with the NFL now, uh, a few years ago, 
They were against peaceful protests. Uh, now they've done a complete 180. Uh, they're on record, Roger Goodell's on record, saying that he supports peaceful protests. Uh, he supports Black Lives Matter. What do you think about the league doing their pivotal 180 and how will that be for the future? The, the NFL, so in 2016 is when it started, right? That's, I remember being in a group chat with like 50 guys in the league, cap was included. And we all were talking about how do we go about trying to fight for justice as well as continue to play football. What's the right way to protest? What's the wrong ways? Everybody had their opinions, right? There's some grown men in there. And uh, I remember some guys said, we're gonna lock arms. Some guys said, we're gonna take a knee. Some guys said, do what y'all feel y'all need to do. Um, but we all felt that there was something that needed to be done. Whether you took it, and we didn't want to create an uh, idea that if you do stand, that you're against the protest, and that if you do take a knee, that you're against somebody that's standing. Like the focus of it, which I said um, after probably a month of it, I said, I believe that the focus, excuse me, I, I believe the, me the message has been lost, right, of why the knee was taken. And, um, you know, disrespect of the flag, which is not because there is a code of conduct. There's a handbook of how to disrespect the flag. And taking a knee says it, that it is actually respecting the flag. How to disrespect the flag is to drape it across the field by the code of conduct. How to disrespect the flag is to wear it on memor uh, memorabilia, hats, T-shirts. That's what the book says. So Cap didn't disrespect the flag. Um, and I, I had a. Not not to turn the conversation, but I, I had a, I, I talked to somebody and I said, I feel like people really are more upset of the cause that he took the knee for, not that he disrespected the flag, because if Cat would have said. I'm sick and tired of our military men and women that put their life on the line for this beautiful country. Not getting the proper medical care, mental care, after retiring from the force. And until we take care of our veterans the right way, on this knee, I will remain. I don't think people would have said he's disrespecting the flag. You see what I'm saying? He just used his power to tunnel vision towards a cause he believed needed to be addressed and people didn't think it was worthy of that. So just to clear that up with my thoughts on that, but to the NFL as in today about with Roger Goodell, you know, raising an apology that, and it wasn't an apology to cap, but it was an apology that, Hey, we should listen. Sorry. We didn't pay attention. Um, I would say, that's weird because I appreciate it and let's move forward and let's stay there, right? Let's, we got progress. Let's not, let's not go back. Let's just talk about what we're going to do moving forward. Um, and I would love to, 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 I would love to be in those meetings, those conversations of action plans um, as well as anything else, because it, it's beyond, as we all know, you know, the, the need was just to bring attention to it. And now we're seeing, you know, some of the fruits from the sacrifice that he made prior to. Now, do I agree with Cap and everything that he did? Absolutely not. <laughs> and I've stated that back in 2016 in papers being in New York and headlines of how I agree and what I disagree with. Um, I think he did the right thing for protest peacefully. Um, some of the comments and some of the wearing of socks uh, that he did, I can't approve of. Um, but I think the NFL is headed in the right direction on addressing the insensitivity and blindness of, of, of a lot of people in power uh, to, the, to these issues uh, for minorities, um, African-American slash black, to be specific. You, you talked about being in those meetings to be able to create change and be a part of change. And a lot of that has to do with uh, 
just a pulse of understanding what we go through as African American, as Black people, uh, to be able to hold strong and firmly to that pulse. Uh, going back to your action item, what you mentioned, you had a meeting with the Liberty University president, Jimmy Falwell Jr. After it. he posted an image of a mask he customized in protest of Virginia Governor Raph, Raph Northam's order for all Virginians to wear a mask while in public. What made you feel compelled to address the situation? as you did, because a lot of people were upset. I even saw from doing research, some professors decided to step away from their job because they felt like not only was it right, it wasn't right, but in the eyes of God, they felt like it didn't align with the mission statement of what Liberty stood for as a university. And to that, I work backwards on that. I don't think it was in line with edifying the principalities of Liberty University, um, first and foremost. Two, I, the reason, and there, there is a lot of hostility to it, right? And I get it, it um, it's, it's not a one answer, but I, per, I have a relationship with Jerry Falwell. So if somebody, that I have a relationship with anybody that I have a relationship with. If I have an issue with something you posted on social media, you're not going to hear about my concerns and issues with it by social media. You're going to get a phone call, right? Out of respect. I'm going to knock on your door out of respect. Now, if through that conversation, in private, there's still not an understanding, then maybe I take a stance on social media out of respect. So I'm not one, because if I didn't have a relationship with them, who knows, right? But I do. And so um, I, I consider, and this is just my opinion, I consider it mature to approach somebody in private first. Um, that's just how I roll. And I had an issue with it. Uh, I thought it was very disrespectful and insensitive, insensitive to, to the African-American black community. And I think it was disrespectful to, to Liberty University stance and also white Caucasians that don't like that attitude being pushed out because everybody has to wear this clothing um, that has Liberty University on their resume. Right now we got to everybody got to answer questions. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I'm in a compromising position as well. Being african Americans, like, why ain't you said something? Well, guys, listen, I have a relationship and I actually know him probably more than most people that are getting upset. And <clears throat> I do not deem him to be racist at all. Um, I, I deem him to in this case, to be blind to the insensitivities. Um, and though he was taking a shot at the governor, uh, he did it in the expense of African-American community of reminding people of what happened in the past. Now, that wasn't a picture of Jerry. That was a picture of the governor, right? Mm -hmm. And people people need to, people, I don't know, I don't know the governor's action since that particular time. Um, but as far as I know, he's not portrayed in any way to be discriminating to anybody. So uh, it's just a time where I feel, I feel like people need to be addressed and, uh, and aware to the sensitivity of what's going on in the world. So we had a conversation. He understood. He publicly apologized. He publicly took it down off the wall. And he said it's not to be worn at Liberty University. He didn't even order. It wasn't it wasn't something he was going to do. He was trying to take a shot at the governor, but it just did. It was like a joke that yeah. nobody laughed at. Like your attentions, one thing. But let me let me break it down for you. And it just it just kind of backfired on him, right? Big time. It did. Yeah. It did backfire. It did. Um, but you know. He's a good man, you know. Uh, as far as when it comes to when it comes to these racial things, uh, this is a time. I'm not gonna say this is a time like it hasn't been, 
another time. <laughs> you know, we just live in a society, in a world, um, especially with social media, everything being right beside us 24 seven and painting these pictures and chopping, editing videos and the lack of understanding full context because not the lack of because of ignorance, but the lack of because of the inability, you know, I only could go as far as my gas uh, tank is full, right? If it's not full, if it's a half a tank, that's all I can give them. And we're going off of half opinions, half results, half of a lot of stuff. And so I try to be overly hyper aware of that when I approach um, these racial issues more than anything, right? Because it's deeper than race, you know? Uh, if we didn't have the color of our skins, we still, humans, not, we, still as human, not just saying I meet you, we, we as humans still would find ways to cause division. If we were just bone, uh, your, your, your nose bone is longer. So that means you are this way, you know, your foot is bigger. So that means you have more privilege or we still will find a way because it's sin. We're, we're a falling world and um, that's the issue at hand. Do you think you will be doing any work outside of that to, I don't know whether or not, I could see potential partnerships or even being involved in the player coalition. Any chance that you may jump on? Yes. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with the NFLPA about how I could contribute and help. And uh, those aren't solidified in answers uh, other than just continually to continuing to be informed of facts and how to present those in order to not even persuade, but to reveal why it's necessary to change certain laws um, and why it's necessary and fair um, to reprimand those who are not obliging, you know? So it's a lot, it's so much that goes into it, and right? And it's, it, I, I keep a term called law versus emotion. You know, I spoke on this with an MTV panel talking about um, black mental health and law versus emotion is a big deal. And I always have to check myself because I'm an emotional dude and I have to check my emotions to the law. And the law usually prevails, right? That's, that's what we abide by. And so if we're disobeying the law, within the law, the authorities are disobeying the laws and taking advantage of the laws. We need a police to police, and that's not a bad thing. That just means checks and balances. Um, and as, as, as a citizen, I, I need to check myself as well. There's a balance somewhere. And I'm typically, I'm always in between, man, like everything, everything. I'm that guy that, that is annoyingly in between. You've been in a, you've been in the NFL locker room, so you know how you got certain groups of the NFL locker room. I'm in the middle all the time, right? You know, I'm the guy culturally in the middle. I, you can you catch me at stagecoach turned up with Jason Aldean on a, a at a daggone country concert, then turn around and catch me uh, at a Jay Z concert, vibing, knowing every word and everything. I'm in the middle uh, when it comes to voting. I vote independent. I'm in the middle, and I'm gonna explain why I'm in the middle. And you know these situations, right? You know, Jerry Falwell, Liberty University, how it seems, you know, Rashad, why would you not attack? You know, it's like, well, I'm in a, I am I have a way of living. <laughs> I have an accountability that's higher than any human being. And I got to stay with inside of these uh, confines. I, I, I'm, I'm more so loyal to. Uh, the lyrics of God more so than the lyrics of a man. And uh, that's not saying that anybody else isn't or is. I'm just only speaking for myself, right, of why I stand in the middle of so much and want peace amongst everyone, love amongst everyone, um, regardless of ethnicity, background. I was in 2015. Was it Dick Clark? Uh, Dick Clark, what is it, Rockin' New Year's Eve party? Is that how you say it? They asked me mm -hmm. on the street. They said, Rashad Jennings, what is your New Year's? Uh, not religious. They said, what is your New Year's hope? And I said, uh, you know what? Honestly, I just wish for everybody 
culture, ethnicity, backgrounds, um, finances, uh, religions, that we all can find a common ground and f- work from where we agree on, not starting from what we disagree on and build out there. Now, that's that's strong, bro. You have a, a, a big tendency as we follow your career after football and even into the transition of who you are today to not only implement change, but be about it by living, by showing people who you are. So, bro, we appreciate the time, man. And uh, just know you are more than welcome to come back anytime you want to, especially after we get through this pandemic, you can sit down and join us inside of the studio. Yeah, I love to, man. Come out there and mess with you. We got to get a workout in, too. Oh, absolutely. See if you can do the bench press the most, 225, baby. Oh, I see you wearing them salsa lessons. Yeah. But I I ain't going to be dancing (laughs) with you, though, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to get on that Capoeira, man. What you know about that, Rashad? Hey, you said what now? I'm trying to get on that Capoeira. The Brazilian. You about to to educate me? It's like, uh, who who was the guy in Street Fighter back in the days? I used to do the dancing and. Moving around and all of that, Eddie, Eddie Gordo. Oh snap! Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a Brazilian. <laughs> yeah, that's a Brazilian dance and it's, it's a a fighting form, an art form too. So if I do anything, I'm gonna try to do that. I think I gotta lose another twenty pounds before I do that, though. But bro, I'm all for it, man. I'm all for dancing, man. Do it. Do you know what? Regardless, that there's no wrong way to dance. There's only better ways, right? So. Go, 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 go burn some candles, cut on some good music tonight with somebody special and dance, man. Enjoy life. Sure. Right on, bro. We'll take that, man. Appreciate you, my dude. All right.